It's like flying into a blowtorch. In the years following the Second World War, at what was then the Muroc Airfield, which is known today as the Edwards Air Force Base, a group of visionary scientists and war-hardened military men started one of the great scientific quests of all time. The quest for speed. In its early stage it culminated with the first famous supersonic flight by Chuck Egan, and this is when the story usually stops. But the experimentation kept going, eventually becoming the saga of the X-Planes. The last of them, the X-15, was capable of reaching the Kármán line, 100 km of altitude, which is the conventional boundary between the atmosphere and the space. In 1967, Flight 188 also reached the high hypersonic speed of Mach 6.7, the world speed record for a piloted airplane. The record was set at the height of 31.3 km, where the air is thin and the pressure is low, and there was a good reason for going that high. The reason being that if you try to fly at that speed inside the dense part of the atmosphere, the friction with the air is so high that it develops blistering temperatures like flying into a blowtorch. Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. In this video we are having an overview of the technological issues that rise when flying at high Mach number in the hypersonic domain. We will cover four points, but there is too much to discuss for a single video, so we will go back to each of those points in the future with more detail. In this video we set the scene for diving deep into the hypersonic flight science. Let's get going! The main problem of hypersonic flight is obviously heat, and hypersonic weapon may easily find itself operating around 2000 Kelvin. It is easy to understand how such a high temperatures are challenging for the material used to build the weapon. Some materials will simply melt, others will lose their structural properties and become too fragile to bear the loads of flight. The heat is produced by two basic mechanisms. First, the airflow slows down approaching the weapon, and the kinetic energy contained in the flow is turned into heat. This process is very complex and it is also difficult to describe it intuitively, but heat happens for real. Second, the conditions of the hypersonic flow increase the effect of the fluid viscosity. Where there is viscosity, there is attrition. Where there is attrition, there also is energy dissipation, and the dissipated energy is turned into heat. Also, at the speed, heat and temperatures at which hypersonic weapons can operate, the radiation of heat becomes important, more important than convection, and it heavily influences the distribution of temperatures around the missile, creating very, very peculiar flight conditions. Everything that flies has to be stable and controllable. A missile is stable if, left to its own devices, with no external inputs, it doesn't deviate from the straight horizontal trajectory. It is controllable if, by doing something like moving an aerodynamic surface or orienting a nozzle, we can change the missile trajectory in a predictable way. Hypersonic weapons are often long and flat, sort of shaped like a surf table, because they need to generate lift, but they have little wiggle room to do so. The weapon should be contained, included within the bow shock, to avoid a series of aerodynamic unwanted consequences, and at hypersonic speed, 
the shock angle is very narrow. The flat body can generate more lift than the cylindrical body of the missile and it is accompanied by short and stubby aerodynamic surfaces, sometimes with a V-section. All of this needs to stay inside the shock so the design is very peculiar and it is immediately recognizable. These particular flow conditions actually generated a new field of study derived from aerodynamics and called aerothermodynamics. With the temperatures involved in the hypersonic flight, it is natural that a sheet of plasma is forming around the weapon. Plasma can screen the weapon from radio waves, making radar guidance or data links very difficult to introduce. There are different approaches possible to overcome this issue, and it, indeed, it has been done. However, it is a further complexity in an already complex field. Hypersonic speeds are regularly achieved with rockets, but if we want to propel a hypersonic cruise missile, we need a specific type of propulsion, the scramjets. At low subsonic speed, propellers do just fine. From transonic to supersonic, turbojets have the most efficiency. From Mach 2 to Mach 4, roughly, runjets do their best, but if you want to achieve very high speeds, hypersonic speeds, scramjets are your solution. The scramjet defining characteristic is that the flow within the engine never slows down below the speed of sound. Working scramjets are a relatively recent acquisition and their development required a number of technology breakthroughs in the era of high temperature aerodynamics and fuels. So, to understand hypersonic weapons, we have to understand a wide range of technologies and it is no surprise that only the most advanced countries can build anything in this area. If you like this video, you might like these ones beside me that cover similar subjects from an unusual point of view. Please subscribe, hit the bell, ask me anything and if you really love my work please consider supporting me on patreon or subscribestar thank you very very much for watching goodbye